The EU has agreed to a 13th round of sanctions against Russia. The move coming as the Kremlin's war against Ukraine nears its second anniversary and as Ukraine loses ground on the battlefield. Its forces recently withdrew the eastern town of Avdivka after months of heavy fighting. This unverified Russian footage purports to show soldiers there replacing the Ukrainian flag with their own. Now, since February 2022, the EU has banned goods worth over 43 billion euros that would have been exported to Russia. It includes advanced technology, items like radar systems, drones, camouflage gear or weapons, and luxury items sought by Russia's elite. On the import side, the goods under sanctions are even more valuable. Russian commodities worth 90, more than 90 1 billion euros, excuse me, are now banned across the block, including coal, iron, gold, and steel, as well as Russia's most iconic and coveted products, vodka and caviar. Here's a look at how Russia's economy is doing under the penalties already in place. The defense industry is currently the most important pillar of the Russian economy. Thanks to significantly increased government spending, the defense industry accounts for 10% of GDP. Other sectors, such as the steel industry, are also benefiting. After the slump in 2022, the Russian economy is now growing, according to data from Moscow. Growth is also forecast for 2024. What's happening is that Russia is actually, ironically, becoming more like the Soviet Union in that it has high spending on the military and, in some cases, heavy industry, and at the same time the level of consumption is falling for the population. But industrial production is also doing surprisingly well, for example, in the automotive sector. Components are increasingly coming from China after the Europeans withdrew from Russia Thanks to Chinese imports, the Russian economy is being kept afloat. China is, of course, not officially participating in the sanctions, so it is not a partner, so to speak, of Western states when it comes to sanctions. To finance imports, Russia needs export income from gas sales. These have fallen dramatically at times. The EU's extensive import ban seems to have had an effect. Tapping into new customers with new pipelines is only a partial substitute. The volumes involved uh, with the pipelines uh, are very, very different uh, when you compare them for what the pipelines can transport uh, to, to the EU or can transport to, to China. And even the new infrastructural projects like Power of Siberia 2 uh, are still in the infant state. However, oil sales, Russia's second most important source of export revenue, are almost as good as before the war in Ukraine. This is despite EU sanctions aimed at enforcing a price cap of 60 US dollars a barrel. Transportation of, of oil um, probably are violating the, the cap. So there is weak enforcement on the side of authorities. There is also shadow trading uh, where, you know, uh, oil uh, is uh, uh, discharged and charged uh, on another vessel uh, overseas. More and more, oil is ending up in India. Its most important oil supplier is now Russia. Nevertheless, Russia's growth is partly financed on credit, including military spending. How long can Putin actually afford to do this? You can ride that for quite a while. Russia had a very low debt level at the beginning of the war. It still has a low debt level even now. Russia does not look set to run out of money to finance the war in Ukraine anytime soon. So let's get more on this now. We are joined by Mikhail Kutahin. He is an economic analyst and specialist in the oil and gas market. He's joining us from Oslo. Thank you so much for your time. We just heard in that report that the Russian economy is growing again. Does that mean that the European Union and U.S. sanctions aren't working? Or is the central bank of Russia just that skilled at avoiding them? Well, the sanctions do work. If we compare the oil and gas revenues to the federal budget uh, last year, and the year before, we see that uh, the oil and gas revenues have lost about $73 billion. This is the result of uh, 
the price cap on the Russian oil and, uh, uh, well, the uh, retreat uh, of Gazprom from the European market. And when we look at the prospects of the Russian economic growth, we see that 2.3% of GDP growth uh, this year uh, reflect a very distorted economy. The uh, military uh, industries are actually growing and prospering, but the industries that provide um, well, uh, social and economic growth to the populations are in, the, in a very poor shape. As to the sanctions, I think, yes, it is possible to increase the pressure of sanctions on uh, Russia, because we see now that some sort of a secondary wave of sanctions are affecting Russian trade with China, United Arab Emirates, and Turkey. The banks in these three countries are now um, unwilling to deal with transactions uh, of uh, cash uh, for Russian trade. And I think this um, tendency is going to get stronger and stronger. Why? Do you think, do you think it's because it's, you know, Russia is coming under increased pressure? And, and what could the European Union and the United States do to hit Russia harder, in your opinion? Yes, I think this is a very powerful instrument of pressure, uh, secondary sanctions against the banks. Uh, not the, some companies that cooperate with Russia in providing it with military equipment and uh, some cash, but banks. Banks are very much afraid to be sanctioned by uh, their international uh, partners in the United States, in the EU. And this seems to be an increase in pressure. And uh, uh, I am pessimistic about the future of the Russian economy because I see now that the Russia, uh, Russia's sovereign fund uh, is being depleted very quickly. The uh, funds which are still liquid in this, uh, well, cash hoard are uh, being depleted at the tempo that maybe in uh, less than two years there will be no more money in this fund and the government will have to, well, to milk the companies as it, it, it is doing okay. now. And the population. Sorry, I just want to ask you just very briefly, because, I mean, you, you mentioned banks and the pressure that are on banks. Um, you know, when we think about the Russian economy, what most people think of about is the energy sector. We heard that oil sales are as strong as before the war. How can that be if Germany and others in the West have cut their reliance on Russian energy? What's going on in that sector? No, no, nobody was going to stop the Russian oil exports. The problem was with the revenues from that export. And this is why the uh, initiators of the sanctions decided there should be a price cap on the Russian oil, $60 per one barrel of Russian oil delivered by sea. And we see that uh, the first sales, uh, the Russian government receives revenues from the first sale of Russian oil. And to avoid um, this situation, Russian oil companies and some other companies decided to sell that oil. Uh, the first sale goes to, uh, well, subsidiaries of Russian companies. And then several subsidiaries and intermediaries resell that oil with profit. And the mm. profit does not go okay. into the Russian budget. Okay, we have to leave it there, unfortunately. But we thank you so much for joining us to share your expertise. Mikhail Kutikin, speaking with us from Oslo. We appreciate it. I'm joined now by Professor Jeffrey Zonenfeld. He's the Senior Associate Dean at the Yale School of Business Management. Professor, it's good to have you with us. I, I, I want to start by just asking you, is this the needed response to a war in Ukraine that is now entering, or about to enter its third year, and that comes on the heels of the death of Alexei Navalny? Uh, yes, uh, great question and tragically great timing for your great question. It is needed. Uh, we've had various warning shots over the bow of increasingly stiff sanctions, and yet there's still more that has to be done. We alone had a lot to do with catalyzing the historic exit of 1,200 major uh, multinationals uh, to leave Russia. That's six times the retreat from South Africa in protest of the apartheid regime. And there are all kinds of sanctions, of course, we, as we know, in financial sector and some other sectors, but there's not enough. Um, and this is, uh, I think, going to be very effective. The oil you know, price caps were 
we're pretty strong, but this will do even far more. B Professor, you know, you, you will certainly understand there is a level of cynicism, though, among the public. Um, this is the 13th round of sanctions that the European Union has slapped um, against Russia. How many rounds of sanctions will it take to get the desired outcome? Well, it'll take a lot more, and it isn't like giving one weapon system either is going to do it. So please, uh, I hope our, any cynical viewers keep in mind that uh, the uh, Leopard's tanks uh, from you folks or the Abrams tanks from mm -hmm. here aren't going to do it alone. The HIMARS systems weren't going to do it alone. The, the F-16s weren't going to do it alone. Uh, the, uh, the, the various uh, uh, kinds of uh, 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 Patriot missile systems and things uh, provide protection and defense. But just like we need multiple weapon systems and now they're short on artillery, we also need a lot tighter sanctions. The sanctions have been very effective. What your viewers have to understand is Putin is concealing his economic statistics from the International mm -hmm. Monetary Fund, from the IMF. Their own economists have told us, the IMF, and we have it recorded, that mm -hmm. they don't know how, how Putin, how the Russian economy is doing. They're only taking his made-up propaganda, his statistics, and repackaging it. And Putin wakes up in the morning and comes up with a fake GDP. The Russian economy is hemorrhaging. Every sector is down from 60 percent to, to more than 90 percent. They have zero foreign investment going into it. They had over $100 billion a year of foreign direct investment going in there. We yeah. know that uh, that over a third of their millionaires have fled. The, the economy is in is in distress, uh, but he's surviving because exactly. he's cannibalizing industry. And and. And now this economy used to be 25% state state controlled. It's now 70% state controlled. And he uses a, he uses it at his cookie as his cookie jar. There's no he's mortgaging Russia's future. That may be the case, Professor, but it doesn't change the fact that these sanctions have not um, brought this war to an end, and that is what everyone is waiting to happen. Well, they they need even more. There are chips that get through. Uh, there are military grade chips, uh, chips that uh, even an ambassador from just between we friends, Uzbekistan, admitted to us directly, uh, gets basically taped onto uh, refrigerators and uh, and microwave ovens as household appliances that get imported into Russia that are actually uh, harvested and used for military grade uses. There there are chips coming through Russia, chips coming through China, and those have to be tightened. We, they, uh, the oil sanctions, uh, Russia is not making money on oil. You hear about a volume of oil. Their, their profits are, are, have plunged. In fact, they're, they're producing at break-even levels. Mm -hmm. And the, t today's Financial Times reports what we said would happen two years ago, which is that Gazprom is basically uh, is, uh, uh, virtually out of business. Nobody can buy their gas. Right. And the, the, you guys don't need it. The EU needs none of it. And he can't pivot and sell it to Asia. But there is still some slippage. We have... Uh, aluminum is being bought. We have billions of dollars of aluminum, $10 billion of aluminum being bought by uh, the EU. That should stop. $2 billion of, of, uh, of titanium and things. That can be brought to a halt. And that's what these new sanctions will tighten, uh, I think, the sanctions uh, even more than uh, and better enforcement on, on, I think, some of the oil price caps would, yes. would help. Well, I'm sure a lot of people are going to be watching to see if this round will will do the trick. Professor Jeffrey Zollenfeld, we appreciate your time and your valuable analysis tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, let's bring in our correspondent in Brussels, Lucia Scholten here. Lucia, as we just saw in the report, the Russian economy seems to be doing rather well despite the sanctions. What does the EU hope to achieve with this new round of sanctions? Yeah, so in general, the European Union, of course, wants to hit the Russian economy. And we have already heard in the report that there are import bans um, already in place from the European Union towards Russian goods among them, for example, the crude oil. Um, the European Union has given out a figure which is uh, 91.2 billion euros, which is the value of all of the goods which are banned to be imported from Russia. Just to put that a bit into perspective, what the European Union is doing already, there are a number of other measures in place and with the newest round, it's the 13th sanction package, um, they are planning to um, close a couple of loopholes. This is expected. Um, it is meant to also tackle um, the so-called sanction circumvention and there are also expected to be 200 entities and also um, 
persons that are supposed to be listed. But the decision has not been taken yet. Um, ambassadors are set to meet on this uh, today, and then they might decide on the new sanction package or not. The European Union um, is hoping to have this new sanction package before the 24th of February, which marks the Russian invasion into Ukraine, the second, the second year of the Russian invasion. Now, of course, the EU member states have to agree on this altogether. Hungary was saying that it would block the new sanctions. Now we're hearing Hungary won't use its veto after all. Uh, is it really clear that the sanctions will be, will be approved? Yeah, nothing is agreed until it is agreed. Of course, this is uh, one of the things that we hear a lot here in Brussels, so we will have to wait for the outcome of today. We have heard from Hungary in the past that they would uh, like to analyze the 13th sanction package, and now they have declared um, that they will not block it, even though they are still against sanctions. We have heard from the foreign minister, Peter Ciacciato, that he thinks that um, sanctions hurt the bloc's economy, but that they won't veto it. Lucia, thank you very much. That was our correspondent in Brussels, Lucia Schulten.